Okay, I think we have uh, everybody joining in the Zoom now. It's just gone 11 a.m. here in Paris. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. To introduce myself quickly, my name is Henry Pearson. I work here in the OECD's Directorate for Education and Skills. The subject of our webinar today is curricula, more specifically, how we align a school curriculum with the needs of the 21st century. And to talk about that, we're going to be looking specifically at the experience of Scotland. For a bit of context, for those who might not know already, Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence, or CFE, was implemented in 2010, and it aims to provide students with a holistic, coherent, and future-oriented approach to learning between the ages of three and 18. And in 2020, Scotland then invited the OECD to assess the implementation of CFE in primary schools and secondary schools. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, just a quick note that we're aware that this is in the middle of a school day. So this is being recorded and will be made available later for those who didn't catch it. Uh, so let me quickly introduce our panel to dis discuss the topic. We have uh, Graham Logan, who is the Director of Learning at the Scottish Government. From the OECD side, we have Beatrice Pong, Senior Analyst at the, in the Directorate for Education and Skills. And we have a few other people on the line who are going to help us out with questions later on. We have Professor Anne Looney, who is one of the authors of the report uh, and is Executive Dean of the Institute of Education in Dublin City University. We also have Professor Jan van den Acker, who is another co-author of the report and Professor Emeritus at the University of Twente. And also from the OECD, we have Roman Vianney, who is yet another author of the report and an analyst here in the OECD's Directorate for Education and Skills. So how it's going to work, we're going to hear from Graham first, uh, then Beatrice, and then we're going to have time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and write it in the chat and I will read out as many as I can. Uh, small warning that we usually get far too many questions than we can answer. Uh, so I will read out what I can, but you won't go unheard. We do look at all the questions afterwards. It's just that we only have one hour in this session and we can't really get to all of them. Um, so that's enough from me. I'm going to stop talking and I will hand over to Graham. Graham, please go ahead. Thank you, Henry, and a very good morning, colleagues. It's a real pleasure and honour to join colleagues from across Scotland and indeed across the world today on this historic day for Curriculum for Excellence. 20 years since we had a national debate in Scotland on the future of education and the curriculum, over 16 years since the inception of Curriculum for Excellence, and as Henry said, 10 years since the implementation. So today we are looking forward uh, for, to the future of the curriculum in Scotland and indeed using the report from the OECD today to help inform and shape what that curriculum will look like over the next 10 years. So Roman, if you could move on to my next slide. Today, I'm gonna to cover very briefly an overview of Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence for colleagues who are joining us uh, internationally who might not know so much about it. I'm briefly going to talk about the rationale for the review and the benefits of engaging with the OECD from our perspective. Thanks. So Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence is all about helping children and young people gain the knowledge and skills and attributes that they will need throughout learning, life and work. It put, puts the needs of learners right at the heart of the curriculum and it's centred really around four capacities. We want all children and young people in Scotland to become successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. And we look forward to continuing to understand how we can achieve that vision for the educated young Scots and how we can continue to develop those capacities for all um, young people. And indeed, in the most recent PISA survey from the OECD, looking at global competencies, young people in Scotland perform very well in terms of some of these skills for 21st century life. Thanks, Romain. The Curriculum for Excellence covers eight curriculum areas and importantly, four contexts for learning. 
and we regard the curriculum as a totality of all that is planned for children and young people throughout their education. You can see our four contexts for learning here, which includes the curriculum areas and subjects, interdisciplinary learning, learning through the ethos and life of the school as a community, and very importantly, opportunities for personal achievement. And it's that broad general education and broad achievement and experience that we're keen all our young people benefit from. And I suppose you could summarise Curriculum for Excellence in terms of teachers as being about freedom within a framework. It sets a broad national framework with experiences and outcomes and provides teachers with significant levels of autonomy and flexibility uh, to create and make a curriculum that meets the needs of the young people in their care. And I can certainly remember as, as a head teacher in the early days of Curriculum for Excellence, just how the framework captured the imagination and creativity of our profession and all the work that went into bringing this to life for children and young people across our country. Thanks, Romaine. So the key question is, why review the Curriculum for Excellence now? Well, as I said at the outset, at this point, more than 10 years into the implementation, it's an important opportunity for us to reflect on what is working well, and more importantly, what we can learn to move to the next phase of curriculum assessment and qualifications in Scotland. And of course, there's been a lot of key issues that have been subject to much debate more recently. That includes the balance between the breadth and depth of learning and, and subject choice, to name just two topics that have had much attention recently. And of course, Scottish ministers gave a commitment to review the senior phase, that's the upper secondary curriculum in 2019, and that was subsequently extended to look at assessment and qualifications in the senior phase. And we are looking forward to a second report from the OECD based on the work of Professor Gordon Stobart, who's looking across the world at systems for qualifications to give us advice on how we might take that forward. And I think countries across the world uh, who have been struck by the impact of the pandemic and the disruption to qualification systems are keen to look at how those can be reformed further um, to ensure they reflect the knowledge, skills and uh, attributes that young people have developed. So today, we are hearing the launch of the main report and we look forward to that second paper from the OECD and Professor Stobart specifically on qualifications. Thank you. And of course, why the OECD? Well, we've benefited greatly in Scotland from our engagement with the OECD over a number of years. Uh, many colleagues will be aware of the review that the OECD did for us in 2015. And that uh, review led to a, a lot of debate and discussion about how to take forward school education in Scotland and indeed had a high impact on improving Scottish education further. It talked about the need to strengthen the middle and of course we now have the regional improvement collaboratives and there's a whole range of other impacts from that report that helped to inform how we take education forward in Scotland. For example, the refreshed narrative on CFE, the benchmarks to help to clarify assessment standards and the National Improvement Framework, to name just a few. So we are very keen to work with the OECD in order to have an, ensure an independent look at Scotland's curriculum and to benefit from uh, global experts um, and analysts and to get their international perspective so that we can learn and improve further. And of course, that previous relationship and understanding of Scotland's curriculum um, is a real asset in terms of this look at the Curriculum for Excellence in 2020. And of course, as you'll hear from the team, there was opportunities despite the pandemic to engage in dialogue with practitioners and to do virtual school visits. And I think we're really keen now to discuss and to think about what we want Scotland's curriculum to be over the next 10 years and beyond, and how we can use this report as a catalyst for further engagement with the profession and others to take the curriculum forward. 
The Scottish Government's aim is to achieve excellence and equity for children and young people in Scotland. And we want to use this opportunity to see how we can intensify those efforts and also to reduce the variability in the outcomes that children and young people achieve in different parts of the country. So I would just like to, to finish this, these opening remarks by saying a huge thank you to the OECD team um, and everything they've done for us throughout this review and their engagement with us. And we're very much looking forward uh, to working with um, our partners and with the profession to think about how to take this report and its findings forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Graham. Uh, and now to pre present the uh, OECD findings, I'm going to hand over to Beatrice. Beatrice, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Graham, for your words and especially for your trust in the OECD. Uh, we ha it has been a pleasure for the whole team to work with Scotland for a while and especially during the pandemic to have such you know, far yet close exchange with so many different stakeholders across Scotland to be able to get to present the report and to develop the recommendations that we've prepared. So um, the team, we're all here. And so I'm presenting on behalf of the team, but we'll be happy to respond to questions. Today, we're here to present the analysis and the recommendations from the implementation of CFE. And this has taken um, us about a year, we started doing data collection. We've reviewed different documents and uh, Scot the Scottish uh, government prepared an evidence pack. We've reviewed, of course, we've used the previous OECD report and we've had two visits to Scotland virtual, many video interviews, webinars of stakeholder engagement, and we've undertaken analysis building on the framework that we have on what is successful implementation of education policies, looking at qualitative and quantitative research and looking at international comparison. And so today we present the report that you have on the right. And um, this is actually part of a broader project where we work with different OECD countries to support policy implementation. We look at it is one of the biggest challenges across education systems internationally to bridge the gap between education policy and practice. So we are we have a, a project where we work with different countries um, to help bridge the gap in the way that we've done with Scotland. And I will now focus on Scotland. The process started um, at the beginning of last year, and we actually have a Scottish Practitioners Forum who brings together different um, practitioners from the Scottish education system. And we've been consulting with them throughout the whole process. We, and it's taken since um, the beginning of June, July to go through all the fact finding missions. We've had 30 interviews with 50 different stakeholders. We visited four different schools, but we actually have had a number of good interviews representing schools across Scotland. We prepared the first draft report, consulted it with stakeholders, and then undertook a report finalization to present what we have today. And the focus of the whole report is really looking to see if CFE has been implemented in a way that it contributes positively to the education of all young people in Scotland. The focus is really on implementation, on the effects of learning, and we really pay attention to both BGE, Broad General Education, which is primary education and lower secondary, and the senior phase. We focus on young people and learning at the center. And one of the areas that we looked at is the collaborative and inclusive approach of bringing stakeholders on board throughout the whole process of CFE. Now, Scotland in an international context in PISA has shown declining PISA performance uh, reading has gone up, but math and science has remained more um, in a negative trend, aligned also to broader OECD trends. In um, the global competency proficiency, however, Scotland was among the top five across OECD countries, with uh, Scottish kids demonstrating strong global competencies. 
We also see that Scotland has above average equity in education when compared to many other education systems internationally. And in terms of teachers' working time, this is an issue that we were struck by, is that teachers' working time is spent mostly in front of the class. And this is difficult given that teachers have to spend a lot of time in curriculum making, which requires a lot of time for them to prepare rather than to be in the classroom. Now, when we look at Scottish education outcomes, there are, it's uh, directly without a comparative, without using PISA, we do see that there are different types of evidence to demonstrate the outcomes. And this is something that was challenging for us to see, but we see many positive results, 95% positive destinations, of which 40% uh, go to higher education, 27 into FE, almost 23 in employment. So this is quite a positive outcome. We also see that 91.6% um, of 16 to 19 year olds participate in education, employment, training, or other forms of personal development. Uh, in S3, 88% meet the expected literacy and 90% expected numeracy. And we also see improved attainment in the Scottish qualification framework from four to six, where the attainment gaps in terms of equity have decreased when comparing from 2009-10 to 2018-19. In terms of the past grades for level four, five, and six, we also see quite a lot of improvement between 2009, 2010, and uh, 2018 and 19. For example, the number of those who had a one plus pass in level six moved from 50.4 to 60%. And this is the case for all the different levels. So this, is, this does show, however, the difficulties in understanding progress because there's many different indicators. So it is challenging for us to actually understand the outcomes of the education system. Now, um, we, we, looking at the chronology of CFE, it started in 2004. So today it, it gives us time and to reflect on what has happened. A lot of things have happened actually and schools started implementing CFE in 2010. And so they've had now, although uh, for upper secondary, for senior phase, it started a lot later, but still schools have had time to now implement CFE for almost two, for almost 10 years. So it is time to assess whether CFE is really contributing positively to the education of all young people in Scotland. And what we see is that CFE is a curriculum policy that was shaped collaboratively to help all learners um, across, the, across Scotland to thrive in the 21st century. There's priorities in the Scottish education to close the poverty related attainment gap, prepare children and young people for their future, provide a broad competency-based education and raise standards. And for this, there are main building blocks of CFE's framework. There's four fundamental capacities that Grammy has presented, children's rights, eight curriculum areas, and three inter interdisciplinary areas, assessment as an integral part, and school-based curriculum design that goes through across schools. Now, Curriculum for Excellence, we perceive as a pioneer across education systems internationally. There's been many education systems have actually been implementing curriculum reforms and we see Scotland as a pioneer, um, but there's been other, and it stands up there together with countries that are quite high performing education systems. For example, Finland, Estonia, Canada, Australia, or Japan, uh, for example, and Wales recently. So we, we do see you, Scotland, as a pioneer, and uh, it is a, an example of curriculum making and curriculum reform internationally that many systems are actually looking at. And this is why today we have so many of you watching uh, this presentation. Now, Curriculum for Excellence has um, underlying tensions that have strong implications on the way that it is implemented. On the one hand is the issue of curriculum flexibility. There, what to do, there's flex, do you want flexibility or system coherence? The more flexibility you give to schools, 
the less system coherence can be. So how do you manage this tension? In terms of the conceptualization of learning, there's been a strong focus on depth and breadth, but where do you find the balance? Do you want depth or do you want breadth? And how do you meet this in the middle? At the same time, there's been the balance between knowledge, skills, and competencies is an issue. Do you connect them or do you have a separate focus on areas of learning? And the last tension, which is one that many of you are aware of, is the, the tension between student assessment and system evaluation. Is it aligned to curriculum for excellence or is it aligned to qualifications and system success measures? Uh, so we're going to look at this now. We're going, we assess CFE in terms of whether it has smart policy design, inclusive stakeholder engagement, a conducive environment, or has it been driven with a coherent and actionable implementation strategy? And this is the framework that we use to analyze whether there's, there is success in achieving education change. And what we see in terms of the design of curriculum for excellence, it's a multi-layered curriculum framework. Remy already presented uh, the four contexts of curriculum, but actually there are the four capacities, attributes and capabilities describing the four capacities, the four contexts for uh, curriculum, the experiences and outcomes which teachers use to, to understand progress of students and um, the benchmarks and then the eight curriculum areas. So you see it is, a, if, if you are a teacher, it is complex. How do you understand which framework to use? How, you know, with all this information coming through. We see that it is an inspiring curriculum design that requires further focus um, to, for, on learners' journeys. There are many strengths. It is a driving force. Everywhere we went across Scotland, we people believe in CFE, repeat to you the four capacities, and it's recognized not only in Scotland, but internationally. It's seen as bold, aspirational, and future-oriented. And uh, it's enacted coherently for learners in BGE, Broad General Education, and, is, and also in advanced hires. And school curricula and learning activities are consistent with CFE's intentions. Also, there's a school-based curriculum design. Schools have implemented CFE across the country, and there is evidence of success. And we see, and we were made quite aware that teachers are well-trained and highly regarded and respected professionals who are committed. And school leaders have developed strong pedagogical leadership capacities. Now, on these strengths, there are also challenges that we have issues to consider. 20 years on, there is an opportunity to develop some of the vision's core elements. For example, student learning and the role of knowledge in 21st century curricula. We also see that, as I showed you with the, all the different visuals, CFE's framework messages and core concepts are complex and spread across many different frameworks and instruments. And sometimes it can be unclear for practitioners and lead to ambiguity. We also see that there is uh, some structures, learning and assessment practices, especially in senior phase, lack consistency with CFE's vision and hinder the progress of students from three to 18. So there is a, a gap when you reach 15, when you move to senior phase, in Scottish schools that, that leads to a challenge to deliver the curriculum for the whole three to 18. And there's also variable support from the system to schools to access resources for curriculum design in terms of time space. So we have uh, developed a set of recommendations here that uh, we believe can help balance um, curriculum fraction so students can fully benefit from a coherent learning experience from three to 18 years old. The first is to reassess CFE's aspirational vision against trends in education. The second is to balance, find a better balance between breadth and depth of learning throughout CFE. Uh, the third is to adapt senior phase to match the vision of CFE, and that means to adapt pedagogical and assessment practices to develop CFE's core capacities. 
And um, 1.4, so this is the, only, the first recommendation, is to continue building curricular capacity at various levels of the system using research and providing support around schools and collaboration for design and experimentation and also bringing in universities. In terms of stakeholder engagement in the process towards, we think there is a shared ownership of curriculum for excellence. And this visual just shows you how many groups and different interest groups are represented and participating in CFE and, you, and that we have met actually. There's learners, parents, teachers, of course, head colleges, community learning providers, the BOSS Group Education Scotland, teacher unions, the Children's Parliament, the Access Delivery Group, Scottish Funding Council. It's a large, large set of different stakeholders. And actually, when we um, interviewed many different stakeholders across Scotland and we asked them who owns curriculum for excellence, everybody owns curriculum for excellence. And, and so it is quite embedded in the uh, talk of many different practitioners, but also it's very difficult who know who, who is in charge actually. And so there is a shared ownership, but it makes it a bit blurry. Now the strengths to build upon, we have seen significant efforts to engage stakeholders throughout the life cycle of CFE. So there is a general overall uh, wide support for CFE as a direction of travel. Nobody that we spoke to was against CFE in principle. And everybody saw consultation and collaboration at the core of why there is such support. There are conditions in place for support to CFE's vision and shared ownership, and it's led by schools and their profession. And uh, system leaders fulfill the responsibilities if, if they do so to support others with a clear policy framework. The language has been developed and shared successfully, especially the four capacities in support of CFE's philosophy across schools. And this is pivotal to ensure a shared understanding of the vision and the policy objectives. Now, um, however, towards this, there are a number of issues to consider. And the first is that there is a gap between the intense involvement and effective impact of CFE implementation. There's a lack of clarity on the purpose of engagement and the consistency in use of stakeholder input. Also, CFE ownership is seen as fragmented and needs more transparency. There's too many owners, too many who claim ownership or lacking clarity about their responsibilities. And third, in terms of communication, there's been a constant production and recycling of documentation, described a bit as overwhelming by practitioners with sometimes terminology that is too technical and jargony and leads itself to too much interpretation. So we've provided a set of recommendations where we suggest to ensure stable, purposeful and impactful stakeholder involvement, um, to revise the division of responsibilities for CFE uh, and to structure a coherent communication strategy to support elements of CFE. In terms of um, the context, it is quite important CFE doesn't work in a vacuum. And actually, here you can see the large number of policies around CFE. We have governance, the policy cycle, and how politics influences actually education in Scotland. And we've been quite testament to this. Uh, it's been quite impressive. And we also see the empowerment agenda, GIRFEC, um, DYW, NIF, the attainment challenge, many different um, policies going around CFE. Now, we see that there's been great progress in developing and supporting teacher curriculum making capacity and school leadership uh, and inspiring CFE innovation is widely used as a curriculum design principle. We also see that um, there's other policies developed around CFE's innovative philosophy, hold promise for alignment and uh, offer good practice internationally. Uh, there is considerable educational data available to the public with the national improvement framework attempt to further enhance data quality 
And also very importantly, education is seen as a source of pride and a priority, a political priority, a social priority, and it contributes to the commitment to improvement and involvement and also the intense political interest that we were referring to, which is important, but also leads to a lot of pressure on the education system and sometimes to reactive responses. So um, what continue, the, across countries, there's a frequency of, of curriculum reforms. And we see that there's different ways. You see on the left, how countries review curriculum and some countries review it every two to five years, others every five to 10 years, others every 15 to 20 years, others as necessary. Now in Scotland, it seems as necessary as it's being reviewed and it's very reactive and this poses challenges. This continues challenges to school-based curriculum design uh, in terms of policy alignment, as I've shown the figure, some policies aimed to support CFE are not fully aligned to CFE, such as qualifications from S1 to S3 onwards, and the current system of evaluation that is limited to fully support CFEs for um, capacities, actually. They're very focused only on successful learners. And the system is really busy at risk of policy and institutional overload and reactive and political approach to CFE in the absence of an identified cycle of policy review. So we suggest that there are, uh, and there is a need to consolidate institutional policy processes for effective change. The first is to provide a dedicated time to lead, plan and support CFE at the school level. This is for teachers to have more time for curriculum planning and monitoring and monitoring student achievement and to use in moderation. The second is to simplify policies and institutions for clarity and coherence. We think it's important to explore assigning leadership and development responsibilities for curriculum to a specialized standalone agency and refreshing the remit of the inspectorate regarding CFE. We also think it's important to align curriculum and qualifications and system evaluation to deliver on the commitment of building the curriculum five, which was an original document on how to assess outcomes of CFE. And it would be important to identify modes of student assessment aligned to the core capacity of CFC, of CFE, so that you could measure also not only successful learners, but confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors, and to redevelop sample-based evaluation systems so that you would, in Scotland, there would be robust data to support decision-making and better societal understanding of the, what CFE is delivering. And finally, to develop a systematic approach to curriculum review that is much more stable with a plan, time frame, and review agenda that is led by the agency that we propose. Now, in terms of the implementation approach, it requires a long-term perspective, which you've had the strengths to build upon, you had a particular path to change with engagement of many stakeholders, uh, that, and it's been quite responsive to the implementation challenges. And there's significant autonomy in schools to design and shape CFE's developments, building capacity on the ground. However, there is no long-term strategy. CFE is just moving forward and no structured approach to look forward, plan, and communicate CFE's development with a long-term perspective. So we think it's important to adopt a structured and long-term approach to implementing of CFE that everybody is aware of and that is well and clearly communicated. And so here are the, the recommendations that we propose and we think that it's important to lead the next steps of CFE with a long-term focus. And these are the recommendations and I will stop here now. And uh, you can have the, the report is online as of 11 o'clock today. It's a pleasure for us um, to provide it for Scotland and for others who want to learn from Scotland as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beatrice.
And yes, as Beatrice mentioned, the report is live. I think my colleagues have been pasting uh, the link in there for people to have a look. Uh, and yes, Alison just did it again. Thank you, Alison. Uh, so now it's time to open up to questions. We already have quite a few good ones that have come in through the chat, but quick reminder to everyone, uh, if you do have a question, please write it in the chat and I'm gonna try and read them out. But I'm gonna go to Graham first to, to kick off the Q&A uh, with one question, which is, you presented uh, on the aims of CFE, uh, but I'm interested in how will Scotland use this work moving forward? Um, let me, uh, so this is a question we're going to pose to Graeme, actually. Now that we've presented the recommendations, we wanted to ask Graeme how they consider using these recommendations as we move forward. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Henry, for that question. And our Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Shirley Ann Somerville, will make a, a statement in the Scottish Parliament tomorrow afternoon, which will give the Scottish Government's initial reaction to the recommendations and set out how we can work in partnership with others to take the report forward. And we're also expecting an, an initial news release later today uh, to, to begin to set that out. I think it would be fair to say, of course, that we will want to work together and the report highlights uh, the, the communication and engagement and collaboration that there's been across Scottish education. And we would want that to continue as we take forward this very important report for Scottish education. Thanks, Graham. So let's dive in for more questions. I actually have uh, a very, very uh, kind of more practical one that came in. Uh, global competence was mentioned quite a lot in the presentations and Annabelle and a few others actually are asking uh, what the definition of the OECD's definition of global competence is. So maybe if I could ask Roman to explain that. Sure, thank you, Henry. And thank you, Annabelle, for your question. So the, the concept of global competence has actually been developed by a, uh, an OECD project that's entitled The Future of Education and Skills. Uh, it's a project that gathers a whole lot of different countries uh, across OECD membership and beyond, uh, and as well as experts uh, from various education systems and, uh, and universities. Um, so very broadly, competence is defined by this group as the integration of knowledge, skills, attitudes and values, all of those which enable students to perform in very complex environments. So the idea of integrating those four components, knowledge, skills, attitudes and values, is that learning goes beyond the division between knowledge and skills. And it helps having this, con this concept helps driving the, uh, the debate and the, and the design of curriculum and learning practices beyond the division. And just to clarify, there was one graph that was using this um, global competence concept, and this graph is from PISA 2018. Uh, you can find the whole analysis in PISA 2018. I believe it's the um, volume six, if I'm not mistaken, Henry. Um, and this is where you can see that there, it's, it was the first international survey uh, of 15-year-olds' um, uh, actual, actual capacities in, in, uh, in mastering this concept of, uh, of competences. And here you can see a lot more um, specific examples of what global competence recovers. Thanks, Roman. Uh, a somewhat related question came in from Ewan. Um, so obviously global competence, part of it is, is interdisciplinary learning. Uh, so I'm gonna aim this question at Jan. So Jan, get ready. Ewan points out that for interdisciplinary learning that he's discovered that in their work, uh, it requires more time uh, at the right time and more work with colleagues in the sharing and the planning of assessments. What changes might we expect, given that this is a core of the curriculum, when there is relatively little time uh, that's not in the classroom? Uh, Jan, you're on, you're on mute. We can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> it was going to happen at least once. It happens every single webinar, so don't worry. Ah, interesting, we still can't hear you. Oh, there we go. There we go, we hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps it was a bit, a couple of seconds unmute because this is, this is rather a tough question for me to have an immediate answer. Um, so I, I, I'm trying to grasp the, 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 the essence of this question. Um, 
it's not clear to me what the, there were so many uh, statements. I think it was mostly about time, the time um, needed to allocate to uh, interdis interdisciplinary learning and specifically the time needed, I think it was not in the classroom or given that, no, he says that given this is the core of the curriculum when there is relatively little time not in front of a class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, time for the teachers, you mean, or time for the students? Uh, I don't know, I think that's up for, I, I think maybe look at both because I, okay. I too am okay. somewhat. Well, yeah. Time, time is an, it's, it's a huge problem anyway, of course, the, 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 there's always too little time to teach everything you want. And we have also already, uh, Beatrice has mentioned the fact that, relatively speaking, Scottish teachers spend a lot of time on classroom teaching. Uh, if you talk about time for the students, it seems that the curriculum, uh, especially upper secondary, is rather overcrowded. Uh, and there are so many claims on the curriculum, so many subjects in interdisciplinary areas, uh, that there, there is a sort of, indeed, this tension between breadth and depth, what you actually want. So first, you have to go back to, let's say, the, 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 the classical curriculum question. Uh, what is your major goal? What do you think is most relevant? And, and, and the, when you have more clarity about that, and there's still quite some ambiguity that in Scotland, I think, you can see then how would that translate in division of time over various areas. It seems that Anne wants to add to that, I think. Go ahead, Anne, and un unmute and tell us. Thanks, uh, it's, a it's, a good, it's a good question. Jan has outlined one of the challenges. Most contemporary societies <clears throat> want to teach their young people more and more. So inevitably you have to look at prioritizing. But in Scotland, what was particularly striking for the review team uh, was, was the tension between the aspirations of a very sophisticated curriculum that requires teachers to collaborate, to think, to reflect, to look at the data around student achievement and to do that together. The tension between that and the fact that relative to their other global partners, Scottish teachers spend a lot of time in classrooms and less time with each other. And the question is, is for Scotland, I think going forward is, is that a tension that is sustainable for either the curriculum for excellence and the aspirations Scotland has for it or for the teaching profession and one of the things one of the recommendations in the report is that actually that tension needs to be looked at particularly if we're endorsing curriculum for excellence as the as the review is and saying you know this is a pioneering curriculum it offers great potential for 21st century learning then the supports that are provided to the teaching profession to engage with that need to be looked at as well so I think that Ewan has picked up on that tension and it's highlighted in the report also. Thanks Anne. Uh, actually Anne if we could stick with you because there's a question I think that you might be able to help us with. Uh, join us in the audience we have Aline Wendy who uh, is a researcher and has apparently done some uh, research on the intersection of attainment, well-being and transitions over time and she remains concerned about the resi resistance to CFE in the senior phase um, and specifically the ambiguity of CFE and qualification stakes. How does the panel envisage real change at the senior phase? So maybe Anne might be able to answer that first and then if Jan or anyone else has a comment, then they can go ahead. So it's been very interesting, Henry, looking at the questions in the chat that have gone straight to the senior phase. Um, so obviously that recommendation and as Beatrice said, the subsequent report that's to be published specifically looking at assessment options in the senior phase are obviously going to be, uh, that's obviously going to be very important there. So Aileen's, and I'm familiar with Aileen's research on, on that, in, that intersection, goes right to the heart of the matter. And we picked it up again and again, from, from including from students and children and uh, students in both the secondary and the senior phase was that curriculum for excellence was seen as belonging to everything about Scottish education, but that the senior phase was about something else. And um, whether that is a matter of sectoral or stakeholder resistance, whether it is a matter of the history of the Scottish education system, perhaps the structures that support the Scottish education system, and Beatrice has mentioned the recommendations are around that, but there are a set of contributing factors. Overall, 
I think the panel was impressed by the commitment to address the challenges of the senior phase, but nobody underestimated the complexities of it. And I think that Scotland might take heart from the fact that in my own country and in other developed systems, that upper secondary system and how it connects with the workplace, with workforces and with transition to university is the focus of a lot of attention, accelerated by the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on, on examinations. So uh, there, isn't, there isn't goodwill, there isn't a lack of goodwill, I beg your pardon, but I think when, when Curriculum for Excellence was introduced, you can see in Beatrice's timeline, the senior phase was left alone for too long. And now it has become, if you like, um, the obstacle to the full rollout of Curriculum for Excellence. So I think it is going to have to be prioritised in the next phase of work, but we didn't come across any lack of appetite for engaging with that. Yeah, and any comment on that? Yeah, perhaps it relates to an, an other question that was, was mentioned about what, what would it mean, the change in, for example, in pedagogy and assessment, what would it mean for universities and higher education? That's a related matter, I think. Um, again, indeed, this is, is an explained uh, the focal point of many discussions, how to, how to design or redesign the, the senior phase uh, and interaction with whom, because there are many stakeholders in upper secondary or the whole world is watching with you. It's, the, it's not only higher education, it's also the world of work, other societal stakeholders, but the parents and the students themselves and the schools. And everybody has their own aspirations and, and, and desires about upper secondary education. It's important there, I think, to go uh, before you, you, you really discuss matters of pedagogy and assessment, to go first to the curriculum principles, because the curriculum should be on the foreground in curriculum thinking. So your first and major question should be, what do we find most relevant for our students to learn? And then there, is, there are many tensions mm -hmm. uh, and a, a line in our report that we suggested that indeed you want broad education in Scotland and especially the broad general education should be the major domain where you try to realize that. But perhaps in upper secondary, you create more opportunities also for more in-depth learning. And so not many subjects to be covered and content to be learned and as some of the students said, immediately to, for, to be forgotten after the examinations. That's probably what you, what you not have in mind. So if you have the, 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 the discourse with the universities, uh, you will also have to bring into discussion what do the universities actually want for the students? Do they have a broad coverage in many domains, perhaps at a rather superficial level? Or do you want to have a bit more specialized knowledge with more in-depth learning behind it, hopefully contributing to some more of those four fundamental capacities uh, that we all find so important in Scotland. Um, so it's first about the discussion, what do we really expect from our students? So it's also some soul searching for higher education itself, actually, I think. And there are many voices in, 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 in that sector. Uh, what do they really think is most important? At the same time, it's probably important that we realize in upper secondary, it might be wishful uh, to have a bit more uh, variation and not one size fits all. Uh, students go to many different destinations after the senior phase. And depending on that, you might expect also variations in the curriculum trajectory. Uh, and when you have more clarity together, consensus hopefully, some sort of consensus about what are the major aims and content of the, of the, 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 upper, the senior phase, then indeed pedagogy and assessment are very important questions, to some extent, even part of the curriculum uh, uh, components uh, itself. But it follows the idea about what is the major aim, actually, the goals uh, and the content of teaching. And then you can talk about uh, change in, in pedagogy and assessment. Thanks, Jan. Let's, let's stay on assessment, uh, which I think is quite important, and there's a lot of questions coming in about it. Um, Emma points out that the review is somewhat unenthusiastic about the Scottish national assessment, uh, national standardized assessments. Uh, what should happen with them now? And Emma has, <coughs> sorry, Emma has suggested, should they be scrapped? Um, Anne, do you maybe want to come in on that? Um, th thanks. Yeah, I, I spotted, I spotted em Emma's question there on the on the, 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 uh, the introduction of those, those census-based assessments. And what the report signals is that 
that uh, census-based assessments where all children participate can give you important data. But we've already seen that in the Scottish context, there are some controversies. And interestingly, the controversies around the assessment are about their suitability for their very youngest children and the way in which the the whether or the way in which the the assessments can actually support the kinds of learning that CFE envisaged for those very young children. So what the report says is 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 actually there's a need to look at that bigger picture in terms of the kind of data, systematic data that needs to be collected for the system to make good decisions about reviewing the curriculum uh, and about monitoring student attainment. And while, while there is a, there are lots of data, there's, there's, we're coming down with lots of data. It, it, there's, it, there's a lot of contestation about which data is the right data, which data is correct, which data do we value? And so one of the questions the report poses is whether or not investing in uh, a census-based approach and continuing to roll out so that it's a, it's a test for every child might actually be the whether that's that's worth continuing for the impact it might have on curriculum or whether in fact a sample-based approach which I we, the, the panel realizes is something that historically existed in Scotland but was wound down itself because there were some problems around it but whether a simple sample-based assessment that builds in data collection over time could actually give you much richer data um, and have less impact on curriculum children's learning. Um, um, and it, it is bound up with that overall theme, Henry, of simplifying the system and, and, and decluttering the experience for students and learners um, in as much as possible so that they can focus on the, the the core of curriculum for excellence. Thanks, Anne. Uh, there are. I'm getting notifications that there are 43 questions. So there's a what? Just a warning to everyone: we're not going to be able to get to them. But thank you so much for everyone's engagement and their interest. Uh, I have a question. I think actually that Graham might be able to answer that, that caught my eye in the chat. It's from Paul, who commented on the idea that that many people in Scotland are still wedded to romantic views of the Scottish educational past. And he put that in um, inverted commas. Is this something you agree with? Is that true? Why? And if not, why not? Thanks, Henry. And thanks, Paul, for that question. I mean, I think the report finds that education is a great source of pride in Scotland and acknowledges the very high level of commitment to curriculum for excellence from the profession. So I think there's been a, a huge um, attempt from the profession to, to embrace CFE and to implement it. Um, in terms of the past, I suppose um, a key challenge for us will be to think about the qualifications system as has been raised here today. Um, and I think we often talk about our gold standard, higher qualifications and so on. And there's a really interesting debate to be had about how we take forward these findings um, in relation to assessment and qualifications. And I'd like to look at learning, teaching uh, and assessment and curriculum in the round and think about how we improve the alignment further and how we take that forward. So I think this is something that we'll certainly want to explore with our partners and with the profession um, as we move forward together. Thanks. Uh, there's a number of questions about early years, uh, so I maybe want to just clarify with Roman and Beatrice. Um, is where you noted that the report looks at primary and secondary and senior years. Is there a reason early years isn't included? Yes, and that's that's a very it's a very good question. And to be fair, we wish we had had time to cover the entire span of our early years and school education. Um, however, for the sake of time, we had to make choices uh, uh, as of the, the years that we were covered. And the mandate and the remit of this OECD review was specifically to start um, in primary years up to uh, upper secondary, so senior phase. So what, what we can say about this, as we did not at all interact with the, with the early years part, um, we can say that it is, it is definitely a, a topic that is fair to, co to consider when talking about CFE since it spans a 3 to 18 uh, education. 
However, it was impossible for this review to cover. Mm. Thank you for your, uh, for your question, Henry. Okay, well, don't relax, because <clears throat> I'm about to ask you another question. Um, uh, Amina asks, what would be one best takeaway to ensure such a widely accepted CFE among all stakeholders? What's one aspect that policymakers are invited to do to encourage participation and whole engagement? Thank you. Well, a heavy one at that. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, Amina, for your question. Um, there might be, as you will see with the, the report, I think the report is already available, but you will see there's an entire chapter about uh, ways of engaging stakeholders and what has worked really well for CFE and, and uh, uh, ways to, uh, to improve this stakeholder engagement and maybe draw on the strength uh, because CFE has already been um, really good at engaging a large number of stakeholders. Um, maybe the one most important takeaway from this report about, about this theme of uh, engaging stakeholders is that um, the student voice is very sought after in, uh, in Scotland and students are very often consulted. You see a whole range of learner panels about assessment, curriculum and other questions. Um, and what our report has done while acknowledged acknowledging this willingness to consult with, uh, with learners, what we wanted to see maybe a little bit more of is how does, how does the consultation transform into actual impact in the decision-making process? So uh, our takeaway from, for, for governments and, and more generally for national agencies is that when consulting with learners, make sure that it is very clear to them how their um, how their insights is going to be used in the decision making process and what impact they can uh, expect from the time and effort they put in in those consultations. Okay, we're kind of creeping up to the one hour mark, so I maybe want to take this opportunity for some final comments from each of you, uh, except Roman because you've just spoken for a long time. So maybe starting with. Uh, maybe Beatrice, we haven't heard from Beatrice for a while, just final concluding comments, things that you want the audience to definitely know. You only have 30 seconds though, and I will be harsh. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. We've been impressed by the number of questions. And there's one by Dirk Van Damme about the vision. And we do propose that there should be a revisiting of the vision in light of the research to find the best balance between knowledge, skills, and competencies and integrate it much better into what the, the focus of CFE. But overall, we are supportive of CFE and we do believe that it needs to follow through, but there needs to be a greater um, allocation of responsibilities that are more transparent to everybody for it to move forward. So the creation of an agency to support a much, profession, much more professional review of uh, curriculum is uh, for us quite important. And I'll stop here with my 30 seconds. Perfect, that was exactly the right timing. I think perhaps if we hear from Graham next and then Jan, and then we could finish with, with Anne. So Graham, go ahead. Thank you, Henry. And thanks again to the OECD team and to colleagues today for, for taking part. Just to say once again, our Education Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville, will set out the Scottish Government's initial response to the report um, tomorrow. And I would just invite everyone to engage and work with us as we think about how to take the report forward and how to implement uh, the, the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Jan? Yeah, I, I would say two messages. Uh, first of all, uh, keep on the good work. Uh, curriculum for Excellence, you might say, is a sort of jewel, uh, but you have to polish it uh, to make it shining in every facet. Uh, and one of the facets that uh, is requiring a bit more um, attention, dedication, we think, um, is the senior phase. That would be my suggestion for priority in curriculum improvement, uh, that we, you seriously need to think about if the current design and practice of the senior phase is sufficiently in line with the CV vision. That's almost a rhetorical question because we think it is not. Uh, so there, is, there are some major challenges to be done and there's a lot of written depth in the, in the report. Thanks, Jan. And finally, Anne. Thanks, uh, thanks Henry. I think Beatrice has, has made that point about the importance of creating structures 
that support curriculum for excellence so that there is clarity around who is responsible for curriculum for excellence issues and for its future development. I think that's an extremely important point. Jan has made the point about the senior phase. I think the question about um, the romantic notion of Scotland's educational past was an interesting one, but I, for one, was struck by the optimism around Scotland's educational future in the dialogue with particularly with children and young people and the way in which the interest in the system and the high priority that's given to education in Scotland was reflected in their interest as well and indeed is reflected in the very extensive set of questions that are coming in today which show the importance of this review on a global scale but also for Scotland's future. Thanks so much, Anne. And thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, well, let me first thank Graham and Jan and Beatrice and, and Roman for fielding uh, a lot of questions. Uh, we did have, I'm looking now, 63. There's 63 remaining questions. And we, so as I say, we couldn't get to all of them, but the, uh, they won't be ignored. We will save them. We will have a look at them. Uh, so uh, you are being heard, so don't worry about that. But yes, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, the link to the report has been pasted in the chat a few times. Uh, the slides from the OECD are going to be available on what's called our, our slide share, and that link has also been put in the chat too. But thanks in general for your interest in the topic and our work on education. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with the latest work, uh, just on anything in general, country reviews, PISA, everything we do, I encourage you to go and have a look at our Twitter page, which is at OECD Edu Skills, and that's where you will find all the latest data and analysis. But thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you at the next webinar.